Good afternoon. My name is Kate Quinn. I'm the co-chair of the Edmonton Sexual Exploitation Working Group. Welcome to our series, Pathways in and out of Sexual Exploitation. We've done one on housing, one on the role uh, and impact of gangs, and today we're going to look at the uh, impact of fetal alcohol syndrome. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that we gather here on the traditional lands of many Indigenous peoples, the Cree, the Dene, the Soto, the Métis, the Inuit, Blackfoot. It was our wonderful North Saskatchewan River that brought many people together to trade and to share experiences. And those of us who are not Indigenous are invited to see ourselves as treaty people, to listen, to learn, and to walk with in new ways. The Sexual Exploitation Working Group is concerned for all those who are vulnerable to sexual exploitation, which includes sex trafficking whether it's due to age, financial desperation, migration, homelessness, prior childhood abuse or neglect, mental or physical health conditions, intergenerational trauma, addictions, or any other circumstances. REACH Edmonton, Council for Safe Communities, is our backbone organization. And thanks to REACH and to Trevor and Clayton with Collaborative Media Group, this is webcast live today, and it will be on the Sexual Exploitation Working Group website to view later. I would like to acknowledge all the leaders of the membership group, and anyone who is here uh, from the groups, please just raise your hands. ACT Alberta. Alberta Health Services Mental Health and uh, Addictions Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Act. Bent Arrow Traditional Healing Society. Catholic Social Services, CEASE, Edmonton Region Children's Services, City of Edmonton, Edmonton Police Service, REACH Edmonton, Sexual Assault Center of Edmonton, and the Family Center. We know that some people could not join us in person and they are uh, watching us from the different sites like that the Family Center has throughout Edmonton. I would like to just uh, draw us always to our, our practice of remembering. We have chosen the color orange because it is a color that brings together both anger over all the pain and injustice and harm in the world and yellow, the wonderful compassion and love. It's also a color that's been chosen by some of the anti-human trafficking movements throughout the world. And when we have this color orange in front of us, we remember all the people all the people who have been stolen through murder, through suicide, through um, missing, uh, we remember all their families. We remember those who struggle uh, with uh, addictions due to trauma. We remember those, especially today, who are living with the impact of fetal alcohol syndrome and their families and supporters. Uh, we have one dear colleague who lives with uh, FASD and she says, I've learned to embrace my FASD. I know what I do brilliantly and I know where I need a little tips and tools and aids. So I think it's a good example of community, how we can all learn and support with uh, each other. The, I'd like to just say a couple words about the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network. It's been in gathering people since 1998. That's 21 years. That is something to celebrate about how people in Edmonton, community, government, individuals, families come together when they recognize there's a challenge in our community and we need to get together to work on it. I also would like to recognize that tomorrow, February 1st, is the 20th anniversary of the year that our province enacted what was called protection of children involved in prostitution, which we now know by the name Protection of Sexually Exploited Children Act, which mandated that there be safe houses and supports for young people who are exploited. Again, we, you know, in the old words, but also in the new words, that includes human trafficking. So I, it's my great pleasure to welcome Lisa Rogozinski, who coordinates the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network, and Brittany Durant, who is a mentor for the Catholic Social Services McDaniel Youth Program. And with EFAN, that's the, the little term for Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network, she is the Prevention Conversation Facilitator. 
And just before I hand it over to uh, them, I just wondered if you could put up your hands. Are you, do you work with a frontline agency? Great. And do you work with kind of a coordinating group that helps make things happen in Edmonton? Great. It's wonderful. So we really look forward to uh, hearing from Lisa and Brittany. And then we'll have some time for questions. And uh, they'll encourage you to become a member or learn more about the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network. Thank you. Everybody, so I am Lisa, and this is Brittany. I'm the Batman today, and Brittany is my Robin, I think. Is that the plan? So. <laughs> um, I am not used to doing lecture style presentations. Usually I walk around and I'm quite animated, so I'm a little uncomfortable with this style, but um, we'll just get started. Um, our approach to understanding why people with FASD are vulnerable to sexual exploitation is by understanding the foundations to this brain-based disability. So that is what we are going to present to you today. But to start off, we want to see what it is that you know about FASD. So true or false, drinking alcohol is only harmful to the baby during the first trimester. What do we think? False. false. It's very true that it is false. Um, alcohol could damage the baby through all three trimesters, but the first trimester is considered the critical period of development. So when we have drinking during the first eight weeks, the outcome could be severe congenital abnormalities, so those birth defects, the physical birth defects. But the brain develops all throughout pregnancy, which means that the central nervous system and brain is always susceptible to alcohol. How about alcohol causes more damage to the, oh, I guess I could look here, to the developing <laughs> baby than heroin does? Who thinks crack, cocaine, heroin is worse to use in pregnancy versus alcohol? Who thinks alcohol is worse? They're all bad. <laughs> all right, so we do not use crack cocaine as harm reduction to eliminate alcohol use, but based on research right now um, and the harms that alcohol has on the central nervous system and the brain, we do consider alcohol to be one of the worst drugs to use in pregnancy. Reality is, though, if a woman is using other substances like crack and cocaine, the likelihood, the probability that she's also using alcohol is very high. How about if a mother drinks during her pregnancy and has a normal healthy baby the first time, then her second child will be okay if she continues to drink? What could have happened the first time? Luck, that's right. Now, <laughs> We have, have a lot of research in the area of FASD. Um, in 20 years in Alberta, we're probably the leaders in all research for prevention, assessment, diagnosis, and interventions. But we have moved away from the simple formula, woman drinks alcohol, causes FASD. It is not that simple. Causation is really this complex spider web of risk factors and causal agents. So a woman's nutrition, a woman's age, her BMI, things like that all combine to produce risk of whether this child's outcome is going to be FASD. And sometimes it is just the luck of the draw. So we have worked with many women who have been substance using, but their child does not have FASD. On the flip side, we've had women who have had low to moderate amount of alcohol in their pregnancies, and we see severe impacts. How about the effects that alcohol has in a newborn will gradually go away as the child gets older? False. So it is lifelong. And when we work with the little people, the three, four, five-year-olds, they're cute. They have no stranger danger. They want to climb on you, hug you. You know, they're really tactile. But our expectations of a five-year-old are down here. They're pretty low. Enter the teen years, though. And now we have teens who look perfectly normal, who speak well, and so society, our community's expectations jump up to here. But what happens if they're functioning still down here? We get this gap. And this is when we see people falling through the cracks of our systems because we don't recognize FASD. How about women of the lowest income bracket are most at risk to drink alcohol while pregnant? This is after pregnancy confirmation. So the test is positive. What do we think? false. Who do you think is most at risk? The what ones? People, you have to be able to afford it. Um, so the highest risk is women who are 30, 
who have an undergrad master's degree, who make over 50,000 a year and are considered to be successful. Now, don't confuse this though. This doesn't mean they have higher rates of children born with FASD. So there could be a few things interplaying here. If their child is having behavioral issues and they're going to the assessment clinic or, you know, psych ed assessments, things like that, are we even asking these women if they consumed alcohol in pregnancy? Because if we're not asking the question, that means FASD is not going to be on the radar. So perhaps we're misdiagnosing these children with autism, ADHD, things like that. Another possibility is that nutrition. So higher socioeconomic status generally is linked to higher food security, housing, things like that. And a mom's nutrition has a huge impact on the teratogenic effects of alcohol, whether alcohol is going to harm this developing baby. Does that make sense? Okay. So when it comes to FASD, um, we have worked in this field for a long time, lots of research and we know it, but there is still a lot of misinterpretation that goes along with FASD. It is invisible. We don't see brain differences on the outside of a person. We see it through their behaviors, through their actions, through their thinking processes. And so what we can get is people being misdiagnosed, ADHD, major depression. Uh, people with FASD can have those, but we have to recognize the brain differences first. What we also see with human services staff, social workers, case workers, people who work with people, is that we can misinterpret behaviors. We make assumptions about their behaviors. Our justice professionals and, and correction centers, this is a very gray area. We know there are reasons why people with FASD um, do things like stealing, property damage, petty thefts that get them involved in the corrections system. But they're not going to be rehabilitated. This is not going to prevent future criminal activity because they, have, they lack inhibitions to be able to control behaviors. And so if all we're doing is funneling them in and out of the Fort Saskatchewan or the Remand Centre, then really we're using our correctional centres as housing for people with FASD. And then teachers and employers, I mean these are the children that get coded really early on. Um, I think the average dropout grade in North America is grade 6. So these are also the majority of our homeless youth in Edmonton, would probably be youth with FASD. People with FASD can get jobs, they can speak well, they look normal, but if they're not supported to keep that job, to show up on time, to remember what it is they're supposed to do, then they can become unemployed and then enter the cycle of homelessness very easily. And so what we have seen then is that people with FASD have fallen through every crack of every system because we have not recognized this disability um, in our population, in our communities. So why should we care about this in Alberta? Um, we have never had a prevalence rate. We've always taken stats from the states and applied it to Canada, but now we do. Um, so research done out of the Greater Toronto Area places it at 4%. So this means that we can apply it to our larger urban centers. But we also have to recognize that we have special populations that the prevalence rate is significantly higher. Corrections, uh, the child welfare system, our northern and remote communities that have limited prenatal and postnatal care, the rates are going to be substantially higher. But 4%, while we think this is low, it does not mean there are 48,800 Albertans with FASD. It means there are over 160,000 Albertans with FASD. So the government's website on FASD has this other stat, so ignore it. They don't update their website as often as they should. Um, and we need to recognize, though, what the issue is in our community if we're going to advocate for resources, supports, funding, so we can better support people with FASD and women at risk of giving birth to a child with FASD. What 4% means though is that it is 2.5 times more common than autism, 19 times more common than cerebral palsy, 28 times more common than Down syndrome, and 40 times more common than Tourette's in our community. So whether you know it or not, if you work with people, you have worked with people who have FASD is basically the message here. Now when it comes to what is FASD, I think most of us in the room are aware of kind of the basic um, principles behind it. We have though three main components, not two. 
The first one it is permanent. We are talking about brain differences that are lifelong. The second piece is the spectrum nature of FASD. Um, the spectrum is not about having severe FASD or mild FASD. That no longer exists. So before, our diagnostic standards used something called the four-digit code. And we had acronyms like FAS. Has people heard of FAS before? Fetal alcohol syndrome, fetal alcohol effects, alcohol-related, neurodevelopmental delays. Those no longer exist. They are no longer used in Canada since 2015. Now, if someone has the diagnosis of that, totally fine, hasn't disappeared, but the medical diagnosis now is only FASD. So back in the day when we had FAS, partial FAS, we had this spectrum of mild, severe. The way our, our assessment works now is that if you are diagnosed, it means it is severe. You have severe impairments that require supports and services throughout the lifespan to some extent. It's going to look different though because no one with FASD presents in the exact same way. So the spectrum nature of FASD is about this person's strengths and challenges looks different than this person's and it looks different than this person's. Although we do have some common areas of difficulty that we will talk about. The third piece of FASD that we want uh, people to understand is the full body nature of it. So alcohol has the potential to damage every system in the fetus, in the baby's body. Whatever is developing at the time the booze is consumed is what has the potential to be damaged. And so we need to look at what is the body experience of people who have FASD. And we actually have 428, I always say this wrong, co comorbid conditions that we associate alongside FASD. So things like hearing loss, um, things like diabetes. So what that means then, if we're seeing behaviors, let's not assume automatically that it is the brain differences or that it is mental health. First, we have to make sure that it's not something biological, a biological process in the body that's going on that's causing the behaviors. Everyone's so quiet. So this is what our diagnosis looks like now. So if someone, are, we have two clinics, a pediatric clinic and an adult clinic. Both of them are at the Glen Rose. For the pediatric clinic, a referral has to go to central intake of the Glen Rose. For the adult clinic, a person just needs to call. So there's less red tape for our adult population. Um, what we need, we do have to confirm prenatal alcohol exposure. This does not mean we need mom to say, I drank in my pregnancy. Um, they will dig through child welfare records, adoption records, education records to try to find the evidence. If mom will say that, even better, but we don't necessarily need mom to, to admit um, directly to the clinic coordinators. If you are working with individuals too and they do talk to you about using alcohol while they're pregnant, it's important for you to be documenting that as well. Yeah, for a future diagnosis too. Yes. So what we get is FASD with the sentinel facial features. FAS, does anyone remember what the facial features look like associated with fetal alcohol syndrome? Yep. What else? So we have forehead, philtrum, totally. So the eyes appear to be wider set apart because of short palpable fissures. We have a flat mid face, thin upper lip, and the indistinct philtrum. We no longer show the face of FAS because most people don't have it. It's under 10%. And we didn't want people to look for the face, which is what was happening. Social workers looking, oh, you have FAS because you have the facial features. That doesn't exist. We, it's also not good dating criteria to look whether someone has a philtrum or not. So we don't show the face. Kids also grow out of their faces. So a child may have the physical appearance, but as an adult, we're not going to see it as much. So don't go by the face. We also don't go by IQ levels either. We have worked with individuals whose IQs have been significantly low, so under 60. We've also worked with people who fall into average IQs. So it's not about IQ. So we get with sentinel facial features, and then we have without, which is most people on our spectrum don't have the face. And these are the medical diagnoses now. And then we have an at-risk designation. 
So in Alberta, and specifically in Edmonton, we do not want to diagnose before the age of eight. There's a reason for that. Some of it comes down to our clinic capacity, but we also need language to be developed in order to test um, 10 brain domains. The child has to be able to speak, so we have to wait until the child's a little bit older. But a six-year-old, major behaviors, everything's falling apart, the clinic can give the at-risk designation, which means, okay, we need to make sure we're bringing this child or adult back in to do a full assessment. So this, uh, these are the areas that we do test um, after we confirm prenatal alcohol exposure. Adaptive behavior, the skills that you need to maneuver through your day, to get up in the morning, to get dressed, all of that stuff, they test that. Academic achievement, reading, writing, math, where do you fit compared to the same gender, same age. Affect regulation is the new one the ability to regulate one's own emotions. So if someone has a diagnosis on the D in the DSM-5 of a mood disorder, this is an automatic check mark then, they've confirmed this one. We test attention, communication, cognition meaning processing speed, executive functioning, our higher level learning, our goal-oriented behavior. Now I see everyone has, most people have a, a piece of paper and a pencil. So I'm going to give you 20 seconds to do something. Are we ready? 20 seconds, grab your pen and paper. In 20 seconds, I want you to write the steps you take to brush your teeth. Go. Stop. All right, who wants to share their list? Just one person share their list. How do you brush your teeth? There's no wrong answer. <laughs> okay. Open the lid, grab the brush. That's all, you That's all you got. All right, well, it's a start. When we think of go brush your teeth, though, we have to make the decision to go brush your teeth. We have to walk towards the bathroom. We have to open up the medicine cabinet. We use one hand to take out the toothpaste. Use the other hand to take out the toothbrush. Put them down. Then we close the medicine cabinet. There are literally 100 steps for something as simple as brushing your teeth. Do you have to think of each and every one of those steps, though, to get the goal of having a clean mouth? No. But what happens if you had to think of each and every one of those steps? Would it be difficult to do something as simple as brush your teeth? So this is where we see deficits in people who have FASD challenges. The executive functioning, the ability to plan, organize, put things into sequences to achieve a goal behavior. Uh, we test memory, motor skills, and then neuroanatomy. Now, if you're only going to remember one slide from this Lunch and Learn, this would be the slide we would like you to remember. First off, behavior is a symptom of the disability. Behavior is a way for people with FASD to communicate to us what their needs are. So we don't want to make assumptions. When we use language like, they're lying, they've stolen, we've just looked at the outcome and we've labeled the behavior negatively. Have we understood, for the person that we are saying is li that's lying, that they have major memory gaps? And so they have filled in these gaps to the best of their ability with a story. We, have we recognized that? For the individual that's stealing, have we recognized that ownership is an abstract concept? If you're not touching it, you don't own it, that means I can take it. How are we teaching ownership to people who have FASD in a concrete way? So we want to make sure we're not making assumptions then about the behavior. Another big one too is procrastination. And um, an individual that is living with FASD actually said that procrastination for some is processing for some. So he described it might look like I'm procrastinating, but really I'm just processing and you need to allow me that time. Well, in our systems, we really fail when we put it on the individual to show up on time for an appointment. Um, we kind of classify them as being unmotivated. They don't want our help because they didn't show up. Where in actuality, they needed to be supported in order to come to the meetings with social services, uh, addictions, treatment, etc. Um, chronological age may not reflect developmental level. 
Our general rule of thumb is take the age divided in half, but it tops out at the age of 11. So if you're working with an 18-year-old, think more along a 9-year-old developmentally. When you're working with a 40-year-old, think at the age of 11. But this does not mean treat the individual as if they are a child. This is really a message for us that we need to change our expectations and put things into place for the individual to be successful. So if you're working with an 18-year-old who developmentally is at the age of nine, would you expect them to, a nine-year-old, to have a full-time job, to pay their rent on time without being supported? Probably not. So why do we have this expectation for people who have FASD? Natural and logical consequences, I think I have may, they don't work. So let's not rely on that type of teaching for people with FASD. And really it's about when we fail to accommodate, we have created the disability for them. So accommodation means we're recognizing FASD and we're responding appropriately to the needs of each and every person who has it. Now, we know people with FASD are capable, and years ago I used to have a list because I was always asked, what's a good job for someone with people with FASD? So I'd have these check marks, you know, factory work, hand over hand, things like that. Throw that out the window, we know better now. I don't know, what does the individual want to do? It's up to us to figure out how do we make that happen alongside you. We know that families need support. Sometimes raising a child with FASD is a 24 hour a day job. It never stops. We have kids that don't sleep up all the time. So we need to make sure we're supporting the family unit to be successful. How we talk about FASD matters. I'm seeing on social media, um, FASD youth, FASD adult. Why are we putting the disability before the person? It doesn't make sense. Um, you often hear, so-and-so lives with FASD. You don't live with FASD, you live with a cat. The person has FASD. We also really want to move away from saying things like brain damage. Imagine being a person who has FASD and you get to hear all day long how damaged your brain is. So we really want to promote brain differences. And then lastly, for the last 10 years, we have really promoted, it's not that the individual won't do something, it's that they can't do something. And we promoted that message because we needed community to understand, we're talking about brain differences. There are barriers to processing and things like that. But now we need to scrap that because now it's actually about how. How for us. It's not even about the individual. How do we help to support this person to be successful? And one of the staff at the McDaniel Youth Program had a good example at the last staff meeting. Um, he was saying that he had a lot of youth who want to have a license. And before we'd be like, oh no, you can't have a license. There's brain differences. And he said, my job isn't to take away that goal. My job is to figure out how do I make them successful and safe in achieving that particular goal. Also, um, supporting women who have FASD. Again, language. This is one disability that there is so much stigma and stereotypes that follow women, that follow individuals with the disability, as well as their families and caregivers. So when we see a woman who is substance using and, and pregnant, our first thought is not, oh, she's using alcohol and she's pregnant. Our first thought is, what has happened to her that she's using alcohol in this pregnancy? So in all the years I've been working in this field, we have never met a woman who uses alcohol because she wants to harm her baby. And in actuality, it's the exact opposite. She is using alcohol to cope. She is using alcohol to survive to get to tomorrow. And so we need to address the reasons behind her alcohol use if we're going to prevent FASD. One thing we don't do anymore, we don't put up, I mean other sites do, but FASD is not 100% preventable. It's not preventable unless we prevent poverty, domestic violence, food security, all of those things. Now I am going to, because we, we are short on time, we're not going to go through all the slides, um, but just quickly how it happens. Alcohol passes through the blood-brain barrier and the placenta. And in one hour, whatever mom's blood alcohol concentration is, that's what the fetus is. So it's a one-to-one -one ratio. But in the baby, in the fetus, 
Um, everything needs to stop in order to metabolize the poison out of its system. Alcohol also takes up oxygen space in the brain, which is why we see those brain differences. But importantly, the harm can be caused before a woman even knows she's pregnant. So how many weeks pregnant are you before a pregnancy test would be positive? Two. Two? No. Well, maybe. But if it's two, that means you're watching for it. Yeah. It's at least four weeks. You have to miss a period. But generally, we're looking at six weeks, seven weeks, the end of the first trimester. And think about what is your normal social drinking patterns and how do those overlap early on in pregnancy. So most women do stop drinking in their pregnancies, but it's that you know, first trimester, normal social drinking overlap that creates risk for, for children. The only zero amount of safe or the only safe amount of alcohol is zero. Um, we do have substantial research that looks at low, moderate amount of consumption, and it shows significant impairments. Heavy drinking is particularly dangerous. Uh, so is binge drinking, and the slide is actually wrong. We do consider binge drinking for women to be three drinks in an evening, which will pose significant uh, risk to the unborn child. And we are always asked now about cannabis. Now that cannabis is legal, um, is it safe to use in pregnancy? And our answer is we don't know. Uh, research says yes, research says no. But for us, what we see in research is if a woman is using cannabis in her pregnancy, she's also more likely to be a smoker as well as consuming alcohol. So it's that poly substance use poses significant risk. Cannabis by itself, we don't know what the risks are at this moment. So uh, these are just some of the factors then that interplay whether a child is going to have FASD. Um, maternal, fetal factors, environmental factors, genetics. Uh, we have fraternal twin studies in which one twin has FASD and the other twin does not. So that tells us then that there are genetic factors at play to make the one child at risk and the other one having no risk there. So I am just going to skip some here. Um, so you obviously don't need to be an alcoholic to consume booze in a pregnancy. We have light, moderate, uh, and heavy drinkers. We already talked about the high risk group, um, but we also have women who are exposed to poverty, isolation, multiple drug users and alcoholics, and then victims of violence. So women more so than men, we will self-medicate with alcohol as a coping strategy. When it comes to our prevention, um, our prevention messages are not about telling women what not to do. What happens when you tell a child not to do something? They do it, right? Uh, so we know that's not the way to change behaviors. We also know that just giving knowledge does not change beliefs about a behavior. So we have to kind of go forward with both, both messages. Um, our goal is to not only increase a woman's capacity to abstain from alcohol, but also her commitment. And those two things have to go together, capacity and commitment. So I'm just going to skip. So we do take a social determinants of health perspective when it comes to our posters, our coasters, our messaging around FASD, things like that. All right, so when it comes then down to the brain differences that we see, alcohol has the potential to change the formation of the brain, structures of the brain, but importantly, the neurochemistry. So we do not do brain scans to know whether someone has FASD. The damage could be so minute, it wouldn't show up on a brain scan. This is why we have to do the full functional assessment on those 10 brain domains. But when we are talking about, so what is FASD? And this is how we talk to individuals who have it, to parents and caregivers, social workers. We use the roadway analogy. So the brain that has not been exposed to alcohol is filled with uh, highway twos on a good day. What is it like to drive, let's just pretend it exists, what's it like to drive on highway two from Edmonton to Calgary on a good day? Steady. Fast, direct, you're just going in one straight line. So when I tell uh, my seven-year-old son, Augie, Augie, go clean your bedroom. 
He does not have FASD. Augie processes that simple sentence in five seconds. Now, when he doesn't do it, this is a choice he's choosing not to clean his bedroom. But if we add alcohol to the brain, we change the roadway. So that means the information traveling on it travels a little bit differently. So instead of being like Highway 2 in a good day, it is now like Grote Road right now. Has anyone driven on Grote Road recently? Or, you know, downtown in the middle of summer. What's it like to drive during construction season? It's crappy. No one likes it. It's slow. It's bumpy. Everyone's getting frustrated. So it takes a lot longer. We could come to a dead end. We have a detour. So if I'm talking to a seven-year-old who has FASD and I say, go clean your room, it could take this child not five seconds to process that simple sentence. It could take him 10 minutes. It could take him 20 minutes to process this simple sentence. And we, as community and support people, we have to allow that time for that processing to actually occur. But I screwed up. What does go clean your bedroom mean? There are a hundred different definitions. For my son, Augie, it means shove everything under his bed so mommy can't see it. When we're communicating with people who have brain differences, and it doesn't matter whether it's autism, FASD, we need to use concrete language, simple language. So things like go pick up your socks and put them in your hamper. And when that has been done, then they come back and then you give the next instruction. So we need to break things down and use concrete, simple language when we're working with people who have brain differences. Now, we do have a set. So I said, you know, every person who has FASD, it looks a little bit different. But there are some common areas of challenges that people with FASD all have, and these are the primary disabilities. This is what they are born with, and these are the areas that we need to make sure that we're supporting in different ways that meet each and every person's need. So we have memory and recall. Short-term, long-term, uh, working memory. The ability to take information in, store it, and then retrieve it as you need it. People with FASD have difficulty, great difficulty with this. The inability to filter out environmental um, and emotional distractions. So imagine your whole life was like you were, you were at West Edmonton Mall during the holiday season. Does anyone go to West Ed during the Christmas time? It's crazy. Like who would, the, the noise, the sound, the people, like it's overwhelming. But imagine that that was your experience 24 hours a day, 365 days a year throughout your life. How do you think you would react? Would you have a meltdown? Would you have an emotional outburst? So this is what we see as a behavior in people who have FASD, but it's actually the environmental stimulation is too much. They cannot filter out and block out certain things. Slow and inconsistent auditory cognitive processing speed. Decreased mental stamina. You know, we often see with people with FASD that they get stuck in the fight, flight, or freeze response, right? Um, difficulty with abstract concepts. I often hear, well, so-and-so is not empathetic, is usually a complaint I hear. And I say, well, if you don't understand your own emotions fully, how are you going to understand somebody else's? So it's not that people with FASD are not empathetic. It means they have to be taught how to understand their own emotional experiences first before they could understand somebody else's. They have difficulty shifting from one concept to the next. What they learn in one situation, they don't necessarily generalize to another situation. So when it comes to healthy sexual practices, do not teach, you know, putting a condom on a banana to a, a, female, a young girl with FASD because the condom will be on the banana and she will be pregnant. You know, we need to make sure when we're teaching things like sexuality, we're using real words and real pictures and things like concrete stuff. The inability to predict outcomes, um, to see another person's perspective and to understand social cues. So people with FASD, they often talk really well. Expressive language is fantastic. Receptive language, though, understanding is usually a little bit lower or quite a bit lower. 
they have difficulty with the nonverbal communication, which is most what we, you know, how we communicate is that nonverbal stuff, right? Smiling, facial expressions, personal space boundaries. They have difficulty with that. And we have to think of, did we teach them how to understand that? Or did we just assume that they would model it from childhood? Does this part make sense? Okay, so this is where we need to make sure we are working differently. When we don't work differently though, what we have happen, we'll come back to that one in a sec, is these adverse conditions. We used to call this secondary disabilities and then the disability world said, no, these are not disabilities. I think we should reclaim though, secondary disabilities because someone said, we create the disability when we fail to meet this person's need. And that's what really all of these things are about. We have not met the individual where they're at or their needs. So we know people with FASD have major mental health concerns. And they, I think 93% do have other mental health diagnoses, but it's important to recognize the FASD piece first. Poor academic achievement. The inability to live independently, and I think we put this at about 80%. Um, we really say take the word independent and throw it out the window. It needs to be about interdependence, not independence. 50% uh, of males with FASD and 70% of females have substance use concerns. Uh, problems with employment is about 78% of people with FASD have problems maintaining employment. Incarceration, confinement, trouble with the law. We put this in between 50 and 70% of people with FASD. Most of the people in our correctional centers right now probably do not have a diagnosis um, because in Edmonton, we only diagnose 45 adults a year. And we probably have the biggest clinic in the province um, for adults, but that's all we do is 45. Disrupted school experience, and then we're going to talk about the inappropriate sexual behaviors right away here. But just going back, um, this is referring to the developmental versus chronological age. So this would be the average 18-year-old who has FASD. So we think of comprehension. Their comprehension is at the age of six. So this 18-year-old understands what a grade one student understands. Money and time concepts is at the age of eight. When you were in grade two and you had money, what did you do with it? Oh, come on. Candy, something like that. Is candy going to pay your rent when you're 18? No, debit cards are awful for people with FASD. Do you, they have the full understanding that you actually have to put money into the bank, that it does run out if you continuously use it. Um, social skills, in grade two, if you like somebody, what did you do to them? Did you? I did not give Valentines. I think I hit them, probably pulled their hair, and that's not the way you date when you're 18, or hopefully it's not the way you date when you're 18. But what we see is like this social maturity is so much younger. Living skills, grade four. What could you cook for yourself? Toast. That's more reasonable. Usually I have someone who says, I was able to cook like the turkey dinner, and I'm like, really, grade four? I wasn't even allowed to use the microwave because I would always put metal in the microwave. Would you be following, though, Canada's food guide in grade four if it was? No. So when you think of um, the health and well-being of people with FASD, no wonder why, if they're not supported, quality of life is probably quite low. But the individual, they can read at the age of 16. So they can read, but don't forget comprehension is at the age of six. Expressive language tests above average. They test at 20, this 18-year-old. So, and physically, they look perfectly normal. So again, you cannot tell that they have brain differences. Their body has developed. They've gone through puberty like everybody else. So again, our general rule of thumb, take the age and divide it in half. But um, we did have an adult with FASD out of Ontario. He made a really good comment. He said, why does changing expectations always mean lessening them? So it's a fine balance. We, have to have, we want to have expectations of everybody, but we don't want to have them so high that the person with FASD never succeeds. 
So it's more about getting to know each and every person and changing our expectations, raising them, lowering them, as we get to know them as an individual and where their thought and cognitive processes are at. All right, so now we're going to talk about inappropriate sexual behaviors. Um, for individuals with FASD, obviously they can be involved in, I'm just going to say ISBs now, um, ISBs as either the victim or the perpetrator. But I think contrary to the myth and misconceptions that are out there, they are more likely to be the victim of inappropriate sexual interactions including crimes like sexual abuse. And this is very similar to trends that we see with persons who have other developmental disabilities. Now, for us, we do combine in, uh, inappropriate sexual behaviors. We use this in a very broad, very broad um, sense. So it doesn't separate out victim, perpetrator. And when I was getting ready for today, I was thinking, why, why do we do that? So I was looking for some research on FASD and sexual exploitation, and I only found one current research paper that looked at the intersection of gangs, sexual exploitation, and FASD. So I imagine we put this all into one ball because we have limited research specifically focusing on the FASD part alongside sexual exploitation. So when we're referring to ISBs, then we're talking about inappropriate sexual advances, sexual touching, promiscuous, dangerous sexual behavior, sexual exploitation, coercion, masturbation in inappropriate settings, exposing oneself, etc. So I do think we do a disservice that we haven't researched this particular sexual exploitation in FASD, that we haven't done a lot of research in that area, because it doesn't quite feel right to combine all of this into one, but that's where we're at today. So when it comes to why, why are people with FASD vulnerable to sexual exploitation? It comes down to the brain differences, that, the primary disabilities, those things that we've already talked about. So it comes down to executive functioning, the ability to have goal-oriented behaviors, to put things into sequences, things like that, the adaptive behavior, social skills, the ability to link consequences with actions. You know, we think, does the young girl who has an unintended pregnancy, we just assume, okay, she's going to know to be on birth control in order to avoid future unintended pregnancies. But that's not the case. How are we supporting this young woman to take a birth control pill at the exact same time each and every day? She has memory issues, so of course she probably can't do that, unless it's part of kind of a strict routine and schedule that she now just has ingrained or that she has reminders up. Um, impulsivity and response inhibition. So we're looking at how many people have ISBs. For our adult population, it's 45 to 52% of our adults display inappropriate sexual behaviors. Um, generally, we see it starting at age 8, 9, 10, and then the percentage, the probability of them having them increases into the adult years. Now, when it comes to other things that we know, um, individuals with FASD who have been victims of violence themselves, and this includes physical and sexual abuse, are more likely to display inappropriate sexual behaviors. We know that around 77% of people with FASD have experienced some form of violence, 55% being sexual in nature. And we know that female youth with FASD, um, especially those who are isolated or visibly disabled, are at a particularly high risk for being sexually exploited, pimped and trafficked by older men. So when it comes to then, let's connect the dots a little bit with sexual exploitation and people with FASD. Um, chronological age, biological bodies. Person is 18, all of that stuff is up here. But then we have to bring in cognitive processing and social, um, social maturation. So it's down here. It is this gap in between these two things that creates the vulnerability for people with FASD to be sexually exploited. 
People with FASD are also very literal thinkers, struggle with interpersonal boundaries, um, and we often just assume they know these unspoken rules that we have, body language, personal space, and this can be very difficult for someone who has FASD. And then we see the impulsivity. This is obviously going to impact um, reactions to sexual relationships, sexual urges, things like that. All right, so when it comes to, oh, this is a different presentation than the one I had. Now I've got to read the slide. Um, now what? So we know people with FASD are at risk. What do we do with this information? It's about us. It means that we need to change what we are doing. We need to change those modifiable factors, how I am working with somebody. So if I know someone who ha that has FASD, then I should understand, okay, they are at risk for inappropriate sexual behaviors, which includes sexual exploitation. How am I going to prevent that? How am I going to change their environment alongside with them that can keep them safe? So again, it's all about us. What can we modify for the individual? We are not changing them. We are not changing their brain differences. So recognize there is vulnerability. We also have to understand the complexity around consent. And this is more of a conversation starter, and we always have it as well when we need to get consent from people who have FASD, even to talk to one another. Um, consent in meaningful, responsible decision-making about sexual activity. If someone is cognitively functioning at the age of nine, what does that look like? And how do we teach them about consent? Giving it, taking it away, things like that. Uh, because of the link between inappropriate sexual behaviors and victimization, when we are working with people who have FASD, who have ISBs, let's not make assumptions about the inappropriate sexual behavior. We need to make sure that we are screening for abuse and then responding appropriately to that and what that's going to look like then. And then because FASD, it's a very complex disability. So to make it even more complex, when we are trying to determine the context in which something happened, people with FASD um, are more likely to fall into being suggestible. So that means that despite the truth, they will agree with something. And we see this as being a problem when it comes to our justice system as well. They're more likely to be like, yeah, I did that. Um, but did they actually? They are also more likely to confabulate. We like to use big words. So instead of lying, we say confabulate because the intent to deceive is not there. It means I've misinterpreted memories. It means I am trying to fill in my memory gaps. Um, so we see that and then we see just memory impairments. So it makes it difficult to figure out what has happened and why has it happened. It just means we really need to take the time to allow them to process and not feed the information to them. And then we know that people with FASD are at a high risk for sexual exploitation, which also means they are at a high risk for unplanned pregnancies. So we have unplanned pregnancies, and then we know people with FASD have substance use issues. 50% of men, 70% of females. So what we also need to think about then is how are we preventing these unplanned pregnancies from being exposed to alcohol and other teratogens then? So we also need to think of the prevention piece. So we're hoping that with this really quick snapshot of FASD information and some of the foundations to FASD, that you can take this information and apply it in the work that you do, whether it's with the police, as a social worker, as a teacher, it doesn't matter. Um, it means understanding what is FASD, but also understanding what does FASD mean for this particular person, because it looks a little bit different for everybody. We want to make sure that we're reframing the behaviors that we see and stopping that negative talk to behaviors understand the behaviors that we see are brain based so let's remove the uh, intention or uh, thinking that these are intentional behaviors understand brain based remove the blame from it going on the individual I'm going to skip that one 
Now, when it comes to us looking at research and what has been protective factors for people with FASD, what has helped them to live a standard and quality of life that we all want for ourselves, that has been missed for most people with FASD, these are the protective factors. Living in a stable and nurturing home environment, not having frequent changes to the home environment, positive home environment, especially between the ages of 8 to 12, having their basic needs met, not being a victim of violence, having received developmental disability services. I should say, do, do we all know what PDD is? Persons with developmental disabilities, funding for group home, uh, independent living, staff, that type of thing. The IQ marker of 70 is a massive barrier to people with FASD. It's a huge crack in the system. Most of the time, people with FASD will test at 71, 72, 73. And because it is written in stone, the 70 IQ marker, it means they automatically do not qualify for PDD services and supports. Um, so they don't qualify. As children, we recognize the disability, but then that goes away as the, as the child gets older and enters the teen years, and then they become a deviant, because now corrections is dealing with them instead of the disability services. That's what we've seen. Um, having a diagnosis before the age of six. Do you think this is the experience of most people who have FASD? Well, right off the bat, we don't diagnose until the age of eight in Edmonton, so that's one mark. And we just talked about the adult services, people with FASD generally don't qualify. So this is not the experience, and this is where we need to do better and make sure that we are supporting then foster parents, adoptive parents, all of that, to really have healthy home environments. And then when it comes to, okay, so what does it mean to work more effectively with someone who has FASD? These are the key words that you need to remember, that you could teach other people that you work with. Um, concrete. Concrete means what I'm saying has only one definition. We don't want to use sayings like, oh, the little birdie told me. You say that to an adult with FASD, they may actually think a little birdie told you. I had one mom, I do parent groups, and one mom was very angry with me because I was talking about changing expectations of children who have FASD, not eliminating them, making them reasonable. We want them to feel successful. And she said, well, are you telling me I shouldn't tell my kid he could fly, he could fly? And I said, no, you probably should not tell your kid he could fly because he will be on the roof jumping off thinking that he could fly. They are very literal, concrete thinkers, so we have to be careful with the language that we are using. You know, routines and structure are so important, and it doesn't matter whether it's an adult or whether it's a child. Getting up the same time every day, going to bed the same time, eating the same time, that structure and routine kind of takes the place of supervision, especially in adults, when they know what it is they're supposed to be doing. We see some of the biggest behaviors when people with FASD do not know what to expect when there is a surprise, right? That's when we get really big emotional outbursts. So we don't want any surprises. Um, what else? Repetition. When we teach one thing, and this is where we see in the school system, we get this disparity. The family says, we don't get those behaviors, and the school says, we don't get those behaviors, and of course they don't. The child is in different environments. We need to make sure, whether it's a child or an adult, that what we are teaching them, we are teaching in multiple environments, because they don't just generalize the information that they get. Routine, you got anything else, Brittany? Um, allow, um, the structure is really important. We've run groups um, with the McDaniel Youth Program every week, and every week, we post exactly what time things are going to be happening, when the scheduled breaks are, when they'll get their smoke break, when they'll get their food, and it's up every week. And we have the same consistent individuals coming every week, but every week they're looking for when those things are going to happen. So we definitely structure our groups to be successful in that way because that transition period is also really hard for individuals living with FASD. You know, and something I didn't mention, um, most people who have FASD have a sensory integration dysfunction. So that means what they see, touch, taste, hear, smell, they're hyposensitive, they don't feel enough, or they're hyper. 
but it is FASD, so it's going to be complex and it's always a mix of both. A lot of the times when we see that freeze or fight response, it's because the individual is either sensory seeking or sensory avoiding. So when we have the kid having the full meltdown at five o'clock in Safeway, um, and mom's like, I don't know what's going on, he was doing fine. He's probably hypersensitive to sound and sight. And so the information his brain is processing is overwhelming, which leads to the meltdown. The kid who's kicking the shit of other kids in high school, we just assume he is aggressive. And then we expel him and we start this cycle of complete academic failure. But we fail to recognize he was actually seeking deep pressure touch. So he's hyposensitive to touch. And he's met his own need by getting in physical fights with other kids at school. Had we recognized ahead of time and figured out ways to do deep pressure touch in sensory rooms and things like that, we could have prevented a very negative school experience. So most people with FASD have issues with the senses and you have to figure out what are they sensory seeking and what are they sensory avoiding. Another point to touch on too, you talked a lot about concrete language, but sarcasm typically does not work with these individuals um, because they take everything so literal. So sarcasm, I'm a super sarcastic person and I had to throw that out the window when I started working with these individuals. Yes, and when we talk about like consistency, it's not just for um, consistency in how we're as an individual working with someone who has FASD, it has to be between staff. So I think of the McDaniel Youth Program, they have six staff, quite a few young adults with FASD. Everyone needs to be on the same page and having how they're giving certain directions. They have to make sure that they are using the same language, the same rules, things like that. That's how we set people with FASD more up for success then. So if you find something that's working with this individual, share it. Share it with the other supports in this individual's life. So there can be that consistency. So we want to allow for questions, but a little bit about the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network. So EFAN, we are made up of 37 or so uh, different nonprofits, government departments. Um, 20 years ago, we started with no money. We started to get together with coffee and donuts. You always have to have coffee and donuts, but you guys have cookies, which is good too. Um, but we started to get together as agencies because we recognized this is a hard job. How can we better support one another in order to better support people with FASD? Now, since 1998, we are now a funding body. So we get $3.2 million annually that we divvy up to the nonprofits. McDaniel Youth Program is funded through EFAN. Our, the adult clinic at the Glen Rose is completely funded by EFAN and other places. Um, so we do have a list of supports and services on our website that most do not require that an individual have a diagnosis because we only do 45 adults a year. We're also good with doubling up on supports and services. So just because an adult with FASD or that you suspect has FASD is supported by say Bent Arrow or Native Counseling, we will still support them through our FASS program at the Bissell Center, through the McDaniel Youth Program. We understand it can be very difficult to support people with FASD when um, the needs can be so very high. What we wanna do though is really get out of that crisis mentality and really focus on quality of life for people. So we do have short-term navigator positions, one for youth, one for adults. They will offer immediate support to people, with F people who have FASD um, for three to six months. And then they uh, link the person up with the groups that are happening for youth um, and then the longer-term mentorship programs as well. I've already talked about assessment, so our clinics are at the Glen Rose. What we do not want is for someone whether it's a parent taking your child or an adult to go to a Medi Center and to have the Medi Center doctor write on a prescription pad has FAS. As soon as that happens, that means that that person cannot go through our FASD specific clinic because one doctor cannot override what another doctor has said. But now all we have is a label on a piece of paper. It doesn't tell us anything. There's no meat and potatoes to how this person functions. So that's why we really want to get people to, um, there is a wait list, but we want people to go through the FASD Diagnostic Clinic at the Glen Rose. And we have 22 clinics in Alberta. 
Um, but where you live is the clinic that you would go to. We also have 12 FASD networks. EFAN, we are one of 12 in the province, and we are, we are all tasked with the same job, to support people with FASD, help to educate our communities, and then we have the prevention piece. And our prevention piece follows the PCAP model, Parent Child Assistant Program. This works with women who are pregnant or up to six months postpartum, who have substance use issues, um, we don't require that a woman says she's using alcohol. A woman is more likely to admit to cocaine use, heroin use, than she is to alcohol because the stigma that goes along with that alcohol piece. Uh, so we just make the assumption if she's using other substances, alcohol is a part of that. Um, but we have the, the PCAP model is at Catholic Social Services and it's also at the Bissell Center. What else do we have for... Coaching Families Program through Catholic Social Services who works with caregivers uh, in that looks at di many different ways adoptive foster biological parents group homes they also go into schools um, and st our step-by-step -step program which works with um, parents so oh, with me oh okay <laughs> Uh, and we have our step-by-step -step program, which works with parents who are diagnosed or highly suspected of having FASD that are actively parenting their child that doesn't necessarily need to have FASD. So that is a lot of information. All of it is on our website if you're looking for any sort of support and services, or you can email the Edmonton Fetal Alcohol Network. Um, because we have the information at our fingertips, if you're looking for something specifically, just send us the email versus Googling online and seeing what's, what's out there. Um, we would have all the information. So the question, yeah, the question was, does the does youth. a youth have to be diagnosed? So the question was, do you have to have an actual diagnosis to access our services? And most of our programs, you just have to be suspected. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So we're done. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, baby cries, it's so cute. Do you want this mic to go around? Okay, I can speak on it. That's what I said, but yeah, they didn't go for it. I think it. it's because it's online, too. So here comes the mic. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Hi, so my question is whether an adult that has been diagnosed with FASD, do they qualify for H? Yes. I mean, it's not guaranteed for many of our adults going through the assessment process we understand that it is because they want to qualify for H. I mean you need money to be able to have housing um, so yes it's generally not an issue once they receive the diagnosis through our clinic H is usually the next step um, in, in that process of support don't get discouraged though if you have to appeal it that's often what happens with the, um, the young adults in our program. We have to appeal, um, and then it typically comes through. So make sure they don't get discouraged. The adults, though, that we want to see, um, because obviously there's limited capacity, these assessments are also very expensive, not to the individual, but to us as a network. As a network, each person going through is $8,300 for our assessment and diagnostic process. So it is very expensive. We want to make sure that the individual going through the assessment is wanting supports and interventions. So that's the only reason why we diagnose. We don't diagnose for the, I just want to know if I have FASD, because at this point in time, we just do not have capacity for that. It's we diagnose for interventions. What supports and services do you need to reach the goals that you have to be successful? So if someone just wants H, we highly suggest trying the mental health route, 108 Street Building. Try going that route for H versus the assessment clinic. I'm just curious, how long does it take for the process of this diagnosis that, at your clinic? 
Like once they actually get in, yeah. or how long does it get to get take to get in? No, well, both. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we don't really say we have a wait list per se. This is part of our dialogue at a provincial level when it comes to assessment and diagnosis. The holdup for an adult walking through the Glen Rose door for an assessment is confirmation of prenatal alcohol exposure. When we're working with 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds who as children were in care, how do we find this? And we can't always find it. And so we need to confirm alcohol exposure first before an assessment date is given. Once we have that prenatal alcohol confirmation, I would think it would be a three to five month wait before they walk into the door. So usually the holdup though is that PAE, prenatal alcohol exposure confirmation piece. Um, now the assessment itself, we generally do over two days. And we do want the individual to be supported. The Glen Rose is a medical hospital. It could be intimidating to be sitting in there. Plus the individual has to go from this side to this side to downstairs. So we want support staff with the person so that um, yeah, they can be supported through the process. So also we can try to prevent when they go out for a cigarette that then they get lost and never come back. Or they go for a cigarette, which actually means they're smoking up. And when you're high, that does limit areas that can be tested. We don't say that someone has to be clean and sober for any length of time, but it would be good if they were clean and sober on assessment day. But it's a, it's a two day, two day process. And our clinics are multidisciplinary. So it's not just one doctor, it's speech language pathologist, neuropsychologist, social worker, um, occupational therapist. It is a multidisciplinary team. This is why it takes two days. Um, and then what they do, they formulate their report they come up with their recommendations for the individual and then they do a case management meeting with the person and then their support staff and anybody else this person wants. They do their meeting about, hey, this is what it is and these are the suggestions and recommendations for you. How can we help to get them in place now? Any other questions? Hi, um, I'm a adoptive and foster parent um, and we're having a lot of trouble getting the schools to be educated on the subject and I'm just wondering if you have any advice of where to point them. They are willing at this point but unable to find someone who will come and work with the school and teach the teachers. Oh, I get to teach the teachers. February 8th, I'm going and doing St. Albert teachers, kindergarten to grade 12 and it's only taken 15 years to get in there, so I'm super stoked. Um, so our coaching families program, I'm not sure if you're aware with the, uh, of it, it's through Catholic Social Services. It works with parents of children who are under the age of 18 uh, who are suspected or diagnosed. So the child doesn't, because they will help with the assessment process for the child as well. Um, but coaching families helps parents to advocate uh, within the school system. But our position, EFAN itself, we do go into schools on PD days and all that and do the one-to-one. -one. Um, let's talk about some of the, the cases that you have that are complicated that you're hitting a brick wall. Let's help brainstorm some strategies, not solutions, when it comes to working with kids. But coaching families can also uh, help with the school system. So getting linked up to one of their mentors. What else we got? I, really, I think it's really important to um, connect these individuals to as many people as possible. Um, it can be a lot of work working with these individuals. So kind of try and get that wraparound approach if you can uh, and reach out to other people such as our services, even if it's just to have a quick conversation about like I'm really struggling with this area, do you have any other ideas on what to try? So just utilize the resources the best that you can. I know there's wait lists, but I know that our program, uh, as well as coaching families, are definitely open to just even having that one time like case consult kind of thing to maybe help you 
strategize a bit more. And I think also it's important to take the information that you have and share it with others. So we have messed up over the decades by working in silos. We have corrections and justice over here. We have, you know, human services and social work here. And then we have education over here. Everyone working within their boundaries and borders and not crossing over. And that's where we've created these really huge gaps for people who have FASD. So I think making sure you're linking to other systems and departments and sharing the information and saying, hey, why don't we work together? Because we can work better together if we're on the same page in supporting people who have FASD. And these presentations are free. There's no charge for them. So if you are working with an individual, they are. No, just <laughs> um, if you are working with an individual that you feel like an area in their life needs more information around FASD, you can definitely give them our information and we can come out and do that as well. Or if the agency you work for or whatever wants a presentation, it's no cost to you. So. No, the parents, caregiver just calls themselves to the central intake line. Yep. I should also mention Unlimited Potential, our open arms program, works with adults with or suspected to have FASD. This one is lifelong. So a lot of, uh, at FASS, um, at Bissell Center, that program works with individuals for three years. So we generally we try to, short-term navigator works with the person, sends them to then the FASS, the longer-term mentorship, three years, and then we send them to Unlimited Potential Open Arms, which is the lifelong program. Um, the needs of people with FASD will change with each life transition. Um, part of the problem too is, you know, the life expectancy of people with FASD is 36. And this was research that was done by the Institute of Health Economics. In Alberta, 36 is the life expectancy. So we're wanting to make sure we're looking at why is that? Is it drugs, alcohol, homeless, living on the streets in Edmonton? Is it the body experience means aging looks a little different? We have de definitely a lot more areas that we need to, to, to put research in, but we want to make sure that that life expectancy you know, goes up st substantially by making sure we're supporting people, um, especially as they themselves become parents, which is, becomes very interesting when we have adults who are parents who have FASD and their children do not. Because at some point, the child cognitively surpasses the parent. So how are we supporting that family unit to stay healthy and happy and have a quality of life as well? And that would be the step-by-step -step program that helps to, to work on, on those concerns and issues. That's all I got. Yeah, that's all I got. Well, I feel uh, enriched, uh, stimulated. I've got a lot of facts, and I have a lot of uh, deep reflection to, uh, to take away, as well as some tips on resources. I'm hoping that that's a similar experience for uh, all of us here. Uh, really, Lisa and Brittany, thank you. Thank you for the leadership. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for your uh, commitment and for the, the great work of EFAN and all of the agencies that have, have programs. And I'm sure that the website's going to get some hits after, after this presentation. I know we'll be looking. And uh, thanks to you all. And thanks to all of you for coming. The Sexual Exploitation Working Group will be having another Lunch and Learn in March. Stay tuned. Please get on the Reach Edmonton email list if you're not already on that list. Please spread the word. The good news is this uh, webcast will be up on the, the SUG website you know, within the month, and you can send the link on to others who weren't able to be here today or to uh, colleagues. Uh, spread the word and we really want to thank you for a very rich and full presentation. Thank you. Thanks for having us.